Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of the conference uh, for allowing me to present my work, the previous speakers for their stimulating papers, and you, the audience, for your questions and comments, which I look forward to at the end of this paper. My contribution comes from the Lower Danube frontier, specifically the central part of the province of Mesia Inferior. Prior to its incorporation in the Roman Empire in 46 CE, the area appears to have been sparsely populated. Uh, soon after the annexation of Thrace, the legionary fortress of Novi was established, and it, but it wasn't until the Flavian period that the Danube to the east of Novi uh, was fortified. Trajan founded the city of Nicopolis ad Istrum after his Dacian Wars. The population of the city, to judge from epigraphic evidence, consisted mostly of immigrants uh, from Asia Minor and Western Europe. The foundation dates of the rural settlements are rarely secure, but the earliest seem to appear at this time. The area suffered from invasions in the middle of the 3rd century and from the Gothic Wars of the late 4th century, after which imperial control was sporadic at best. It was devastated by the Huns in the mid-5th century and the Avars in the late 6th century, and was finally abandoned by Constantinople in the early 7th century. So, that's the historical framework of everything else that's going to follow. Uh, despite some recent, in recent interest in studying the countryside in this region, little has been done on the rural economy per se. Andrew Poulter has conducted targeted surface surveys of several villas around Nicopolis ad Istrum. And while his project has revealed the physical organization of these sites and their chronological limits, it has led to no new insights about their economic activities, at least none that have been published yet, and detailed publication of that uh, survey is yet to come. Similarly, also yet to come in detailed publication form, surveys conducted by Sven Conrad in the area just south of Novi, south of the river, excuse me, produced maps showing dense rural settlement in the area of Novi, from which Conrad concluded that military demand simulated, stimulated agricultural production. But whether this increased production stemmed from a simple extension of cultivated land or from intensification of cultivation methods is not known nor is it clear what role the auxiliary forts played in the rural economy, as opposed to the legionary fortress at Novi. And this lack of detailed knowledge stems from a lack of detailed evidence. Very few rural settlements in the area have been excavated, and with a single exception, they've all been rescue excavations. No botanical or faunal remains from a rural site have ever been published. Nevertheless, I hope to show that progress can be made by studying the settlement landscapes, these are, that is, landscapes that surround individual settlements in the countryside using uh, simple statistical analysis and then comparative multivariate logistic regression analysis. I will argue that the security provided by the soldiers on the Danube frontier and their demand for agricultural surplus led to the spread of intensive agriculture in central Mesia Inferior in the second, third, and fourth century. I'll also argue that, in contrast to the legionary fortress in the area, the communities living in and around the auxiliary forts were generally isolated from the rural population, with a few exceptions. Uh, given the nature of this conference, I'll dispense with my normal defense of quantitative analysis. Instead, I'll discuss the archaeological data that underlie my analysis and the ways in which I tried to account for their shortcomings. Then I'll talk about the use of landscapes as evidence, uh, settlement landscapes as evidence, that is. Then I'll briefly describe the methodology I used to test for agricultural intensification and present those results. After that, I'll talk about comparative modeling for hypothesis testing and present the evidence for the isolation of auxiliary forts. The empirical foundation of this study is a database of 314 archaeological sites constituting 443 chronologically distinct ancient places in a region surrounding the Yantra River in northern Bulgaria. And that's the Yantra is this central river right here. The data were, com were compiled in a desktop survey that relied heavily on Bulgaria's national database of archaeological heritage, known as the Archaeological Map of Bulgaria, or AMB, along with other publications. The modern version of the AMB was mostly built in the late 1980s and early 1990s on the basis of legacy data and site-oriented extensive surveys, and it continues to be updated with new information. This means that the data are fragmentary in the extreme and badly affected by post not only by post-depositional transformation processes, but also by uneven research intensity and discovery. The problem of research intensity was partially dealt with through the delineation of the study area. That's why it's got such a funny shape. The AMB was compiled by archaeologists who were each responsible for a single municipality. So I just counted the number of AMB entries in each municipality, divided it by the number, and then I was able to exclude districts that seemed to be understudied. 
In the end, the study area included nine municipalities and covered an area of 3,488 square kilometers. I then explored the impact of land cover, alluvial deposition, and accessibility from modern villages on archaeological visibility. I used a chi-square test to compare the distribution of archaeological sites with modern land cover, represented by the Korean land use land cover data from 1990, and found that forests contained about half as many sites as would be expected given their aerial extent. All other land use categories seemed about even. Another chi-square test on soil data from the Soil Geographic Database of Europe showed that, far from burying sites, fluvasols actually contained more sites than expected. Distance from modern settlements, on the other hand, does seem to influence discovery rates. A kolmogorov smirnov test comparing the distances from archaeological sites to modern villages and cities with the terrain as a whole revealed a statistically significant difference, and visual examination of these data in the form of a histogram showed that areas between three and four kilometers away from a village contained about half as many sites as expected from their area. I decided to deal with these biases not by trying to unbias the data itself, but by creating a comparative data set that was similarly biased. So I created a bias surface, a simple bias surface, using by overlaying forest cover and distance to modern villages to represent the likelihood that an ancient settlement would become an archaeological site. This bias surface was used to create 1,000 pseudo-randomly located points with the value of the cell, which turned out to be a quarter, a half, or one, representing the likelihood of a point falling within it. So in a sense, I'm trying to compare the remains of actual settlement systems to what would have remained from a completely random settlement system. There were several other challenges in working with these data, which I'll pass over, but I must briefly mention the problem of periodization. The chronological scheme used here is an attempt to understand historically meaningful periods without overstepping the limits of the evidence. The available chronological data are extremely heterogeneous in quality and specificity, and as a result, continuity of occupation between phases is impossible to establish, as is the contemporaneity of places within a single period. Nevertheless, it was possible to assign almost all of the places to a chronological period at one or two levels of specificity. At the coarsest level, it was possible to distinguish between a pre-Roman period occupying roughly the second half of the first millennium BCE and a Roman period stretching from the first century to the late fourth century CE. At a finer scale, it was often possible to classify Roman places as either early Roman, from the initial fortification of the area in the mid-first century to Trajan's Dacian Wars and the founding of Nicopolis ad Istrum in the early second century, or middle Roman, ending with the establishment of the Tetrarchy in the late third century, or late Roman, ending in the Gothic Wars of the late 4th century. In addition, many places were datable to a late antique phase, which includes the 5th and 6th century. You'll see that the number of early Roman places is tiny, uh, too small for statistical analysis, and so won't be talked about further. Given the quality of the data, and actually also for theoretical reasons, which I'm about to go into, I relied on settlement landscapes as my evidentiary base. A settlement landscape is not the landscape of the region as a whole, but rather the landscape as viewed from a particular settlement. So that includes the area, the territory in the immediate vicinity of the settlement, which would have been easily exploitable, and also other places more distant from the settlement. Uh, but the, the distance from the settlement is an important, a crucial, in fact, part of that settlement landscape. The use of lands, uh, if intensive agriculture seeks to maximize output from certain inputs, then choosing where to live, choosing to live specifically within a productive settlement landscape, greatly facilitates intensification. The use of landscapes as evidence for economic behavior dates back at least to the 1970s when Vita Fidenzi and Higgs coined the term site catchment analysis. And to my mind, there are three main advantages to using landscapes rather than material cultural assemblages or organic remains as evidence from the rural economy beyond the fact that I didn't have those other kinds of evidence. First, uh, the landscapes around settlements constitute a huge part of the structural framework within which ancient people carried out their lives. Since most people began and ended their days at the settlement, the paths that they could travel during the day were constrained by its location. The accessibility of various features in the landscape can therefore be used as probabilistic evidence for their use. Second, it allows us to study people who left very little trace in the archaeological record. As the site of numerous frequently repeated tasks, the faint traces that peasants leave in the landscape are most likely to be visible in the settlement. 
and in Mesia Inferior, stone foundations were ubiquitous and pottery was cheap, so even modest settlements can be identified. Finally, settlements need only be identified and roughly dated for their landscapes to be usable as evidence. This is particularly important when one is working in a country that lacks the resources for long-term intensive archaeological investigation in the countryside. There are also disadvantages to relying on regional landscape evidence or settlement landscapes analyzed as a single region. And I use equation-based modeling uh, rather than agent-based modeling, which will become clear. But this introduces some disadvantages. First of all, Finding patterns in settlement landscapes allows us to identify regional trends, but it is very difficult to detect subgroups. When multiple groups with competing priorities are lumped together, it can be very hard to draw any conclusions at all. Also, it relies on proximity to establish the likelihood of interaction between places. This works fairly well for studying intensive agriculture, as the labor spent in traveling or hauling manure detracts from the labor spent in cultivation. But when studying economic exchange, it becomes more problematic transportation costs constrain some exchanges more than others. Farmers who can minimize transportation costs by combining cargoes into fewer loads or by passing the cost on to others by virtue of their social position will be freer to settle farther from the markets in which they participate. Trends in proximity, therefore, will be most relevant to economic exchanges that were small in scale and frequently repeated. Now in settlement, uh, site catchment analysis, the definition of a settlement territory depends heavily on the nature of the economy. I define my settlement territory specifically to test the hypothesis that intensive agriculture was the dominant economic strategy in the region at any given time. Cross-cultural ethnographic research suggests that the limit beyond which intensive agriculture becomes extremely unlikely is one to two kilometers, or about a 20-minute walk. For the purposes of this study, then, settlement territories are defined by circles centered on each settlement with a radius of 1.5 kilometers. If it was common to invest a lot of labor in cultivation, settlements should be located predominantly within territories conducive to agricultural production. If extensive agriculture or pastoralism were the dominant strategy, the character of the landscape within 1.5 kilometers of the settlement would be less important, and settlement territories would differ little from the region as a whole. This logic relies on the idea that most settlement locations could be freely chosen. In this case, the assumption is probably valid, since the area appears to have been sparsely populated prior to Roman conquest, and in each subsequent period, at least half of the settlements are new foundations. So there's quite a lot of turnover. The writings of the Roman agronomists have been used to identify factors that might have influenced the locations of Roman period farms. Although these authors were elites living in central Italy, it is preferable to use their testimony to that of modern agricultural science because the technology and economic context of the ancient world differs radically from that of the modern world. Although the worlds of Cato, Columella, and the rest might seem far removed from that of the smallholder on the lower Danube, their opinions are still valuable. Their, their intended audiences owned land throughout the empire, so their advice was not meant to be apl applicable only to central Italy. And although they focus on cash crops like vines and olives, they also discuss humbler crops at length. Most importantly, though, one need not accept all of their advice to use their writing. While the factors I examine are derived from the texts, the actual influence of these factors on Mesian farmers is inferred from the settlement territories themselves. Based on the writings of Cato, Veru, Columella, Pliny, and Palladius, I have identified the following factors as influential for agricultural productivity of an ancient farm. Slope, landform, aspect, sun exposure, soil, water supply, and access to transport. With the exception of soil, all of these factors can be quantified using modern environmental data or, in the case of roads, archaeological evidence. Uh, the soil in this area in general is relatively homogeneous anyway. I did try to model it and the results were in inconclusive. Slope, landform, aspect, and sun exposure are all de derived from the SRTM-1 arc second digital elevation model. Water supply includes the locations of springs digitized from Soviet topo maps at a scale of 1 to 50,000 and a stream data from the European Environment Agency's catchments and rivers networks. The routes and classification of the roads is based on evidence from the late Roman period compiled by Michael Vendel. And sun exposure is calculated in terms of the hours of direct sunlight received in May because this has been shown to influence the rate at which wheat flowers and matures and so is a critical in, uh, factor influencing the timing of harvest. Each factor was divided into a number of distinct variables for the purposes of statistical analysis. 
For example, slope was classified into flat areas, gentle, moderate, strong, steep, and very steep slopes. The average portion of each settlement territory covered by a given variable was compared to the average of the 1,000 pseudo-random territories des described above to arrive at a z-score, quantifying the relative dearth or abundance of that variable. In addition, a Kolmogorov-Smirnov test was used to determine whether or not the settlement territories differed significantly from the random territories with respect to each variable. To assess water supply, I counted the number of springs and measured the length of small streams and rivers in each territory. Access to transportation routes was calculated by modeling the effort required to walk from the settlement to the nearest road or river. In total, 45 separate variables were measured and analyzed. As it turned out, landform, that is to say valleys, lower slopes, ridges, topographic features like that, and slope variables were highly correlated, so I'll discuss them together. And the results are striking. Pre-Roman settlements resemble random territories in almost every variable. They prefer steep slopes, which tend to get between 10 and 12 hours of sunlight, and they maximize the total length of streams and rivers in their territory. These aren't factors that are conducive to intensive agriculture. Given how poorly understood the pre-Roman period is, it's very likely that multiple groups with differing priorities have been combined, so contracting locational tendencies are canceling each other out. At the same time, though, many scholars assume that pastoralism was the dominant form of ex economic exploitation prior to Roman conquest, some think it persisted throughout the Roman conquest, or Roman Empire, and that would also be consistent with these results. Whatever the case may be, there is nothing here to suggest that intensive agriculture was common prior to Roman conquest. The Roman settlement territories tell a very different story. When examined altogether, Roman settlements favored gentle slopes, north, northeast, and east-facing land, long stretches of river, and locations at a distance from the largest roads. They avoid valleys, lower slopes, and upper slopes, south, southwest, west, and northwest facing land, and areas that get only 10 to 12 hours of sunlight in May. The agricultural writers all agree that gentle slopes are ideal for grain as this allows the fields to drain easily. Although aspect is usually associated with sun exposure, a comparison of the two in this area revealed no correlation. Instead, aspect should be interpreted in terms of the prevailing winds, which blow forcefully from the west during the winter and more gently from the northeast during the spring. It seems that Roman settlers sought out land that would be sheltered from the worst of the winter storms. The aversion to settling near the largest roads calls to mind Columella's famous advice to avoid the nuisance of providing hospitality to those traveling along military highways. So in general, Roman settlements seem to be well situated for intensive agriculture. When the settlements dated to the Middle Roman period are examined separately, we see a preference for gentle slopes, northern aspect, and the sunniest land. While they avoid strongly sloping land, <clears throat> excuse me. While they avoid strongly sloping land, valleys, lower slopes, steep mid slopes, upper slopes, and ridges, southwest facing land, and places that get less than 14 hours of sun of ridges. Seriously. <laughs> so, r mid Roman settlements are also well suited for agriculture as are late Roman settlements. Late antique settlements have a completely different profile. In fact, it's diametrically opposed. They seem to be settled in uh, primarily defensible positions. So this demonstrates to my mind the value of the security provided by the Roman army on the frontier. In order to assess uh, marketing, I created multiple logistic regression analyses. The problem with market potential, this is a market potential variable and you can read the slide to see how I quantified it, is that the problem for assessing marketing in, in re reference to rural settlement location is that it's probably a secondary, tertiary, or even you know, fourth or fifth level factor in determining location. Productive properties of the landscape seem to be more important than marketing opportunities. So you had to control all of those other variables in order to understand marketing opportunities. So what I did was I created a base model using only the statistical, the variables judged to be statistically significant above. I performed principal component analysis to make to get rid of the correlation and quantified how well it fit the data using the root mean square error. Then I added different versions of a market potential variable. The market potential variable includes all of the markets in a system. And so what I did was I assumed different types of markets would be included or excluded. So I included or excluded the, for the forts, the auxiliary forts, and I gave the forts either a positive weight to simulate the fact, the idea that they were markets, or a negative weight because there's the idea that they were abusive and so people would have lived far away from them. <clears throat> 
the model that fits the data the best supports the hypothesis on which the market potential variable is constructed. So the results, when you look at all Roman, the, uh, the no forts market potential variable improved the model results by over 11%. When you look at the mid-Roman period, the city's only mo variable improved the model the most. For the late Roman period, again, it was the no forts model. Uh, market potential didn't affect the model performance of pre-Roman or late antique settlement uh, base models at all. But what we have here is uh, empirical evidence that contrary to my expectations, the auxiliary forts were not playing an important role in the marketing strategies of most peasants living in the area. But if we look at these maps, you can see in the northeast corner, there's this little pocket of settlements that are living far away from any other type of marketplace. So these places, I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, and this is the next step, were probably marketing their goods to the forts, but everybody else was, seems to be marketing their goods primarily in the cities or in the late Roman period, the small towns and the cities as well, which suggests that the rural period, the, the countryside of Mesia Inferior was inhabited by two distinct populations, one closely associated with the army, the other less directly associated with the army. Now, this is not to say that the army played no role in their lives. It almost certainly did, but rather fulfilling the demands of the army happened in the cities and small towns, not at the forts themselves. This suggests that fulfilling the demands of the auxiliary forts uh, involved middlemen or bureaucrats. And if you're a middleman or bureaucrat working in a small town, you want to collect large cargoes as fast as you can. So this situation favors those producers who can produce large cargoes and deliver them all at once. Therefore, the demand for, uh, of the Roman army for agricultural surplus probably benefited the better well-off and not the poor peasants who would have had to carry their own stuff to the markets. Thank you for your attention.